Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Todd Enoch. I'm the head of Serials and Electronic Resources at the University of North Texas Libraries. And on behalf of the NASIG Continuing Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Working Outside the Library, presented by Lynn Conaway. Before I turn things over to Lynn, just have a couple of announcements. First of all, this session will be recorded and a copy of the recording will be made available to everyone who registered sometime within the next week. Secondly, if you have any questions for Lynn during the course of today's webinar, please input them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. And at the end of the presentation, Lynn will take some time to answer as many of the questions as she can. Thirdly, if you are experiencing technical difficulties, please send a private chat message to the CEC NASIC host account, and either I or my co-host, Linda Dosh, will try to help you work through those difficulties. And finally, once you exit today's webinar, you will be directed to a SurveyMonkey survey, and we ask that you take a few minutes to fill that out. Just let us know how we're doing, if there's anything we could improve, if there are any topics in particular you'd like us to pursue for future webinars. And now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Lynn Conaway is a senior research scientist at OCLC Research. She has experience in academic, public, and school libraries, as well as library and information science education. Lynn has completed several UK and US externally funded projects to investigate users' behaviors and has been funded by the IMLS to study virtual reference services and the social question and answer community. And now I will hand things over to Lynn. For inviting me to speak today. I was asked to give something similar to what I presented at the uh, NASIG conference last June. And I decided to add some different things since we have some new data. And so today I'll talk about several things. Um, you'll see that first quote, with Google you are not limited. You have as much as you can pull up. And this is a direct quote from one of our participants in a study that I'll talk about today. It's called the Digital Visitors and Residents Studies. That's part of the participants are from the US and the UK. And this was a US student, undergraduate, first year, female, age 19. And this was from one of her diaries. Uh, we have we are following individuals for three years and asking them to either talk to us every month or send us a diary entry. And so that this quote came directly from one of the participants. This is another quote from one of our participants. Again, a U.S. Uh, student, a, a different student from the uh, first uh, quote and first year undergraduate female. And she's basic, she basically said that you know, Google's a whole lot easier than going, and, and you can see we have ellipses. She was talking about going to the library and uh, just trying to find things. And she was saying uh, they just don't make any sense when you're on the library website and, and these you look at the first 10 journals and she just gives off. We have another quote, it's a UK graduate student, a female age 23, and she was talking about Google and she said she used it because Google is reliable and fast. This is something that Lorcan Dempsey had published in 2008, but I think it's still very relevant today. It used to be that the user built the workflow around the library. Now the library has to actually go out and build its services around the user's workflow. Uh, it used to be that resources were scarce, uh, libraries were often the only game in town. Now that's not necessarily true. We have um, that the, their attention is, is scarce and the resources are abundant. I have a, a few more quotes. This is a a U.S. graduate student, a male, age 25, 
And he says, yes, I'm sure because, you know, going to the library was a task. And part of, I'm sure, a lot of people, and as far as, as me is concerned from laziness, it was much easier to just scrap around. It's so much easier to just strain to find something on the internet than to like drive to the library. And so they really, when they think of the library, they really think that they have to be there physically and they think of books. This is a U.S. Um, undergraduate student, first year, a female, age 19, different from the other two who I have quoted. I have better things to do than go drive all the way to the library when I can just sit at home and type it into my computer. Uh, there was also a study, uh, a paper written by Wasserman in 2012, and it was in The Nation, and he, it was called The Amazon Effect. And when he wrote that article in June, actually, in June of 2012, he said that there were more than 1.7 billion or almost one out of every four humans on the planet online. So when you think of that, uh, you'll think that that's the community that we're trying to reach. Uh, this is another uh, theory from uh, Lorcan Dempsey, and this was published in December 2012 in the Educause Review. And Lorcan talks about the outside in and the inside out concept of libraries. And it used to be the outside in for the libraries. We acquired books, we acquired journals, databases from exter external sources. And then we provided these discovery systems basically for our individual constituencies. Uh, now he's saying that we really need to go more to this inside out because now the libraries are actually producers of resources. We have our special collections, we're digitizing them, we're digitizing images, uh, we have administrative records, we have research data that many of our researchers are, try, are may want to distribute or reuse or share. Uh, so there we have our learning, our teaching and learning materials, so all of these things now are becoming open to everyone. And we really need to be thinking about discoverability of institutional resources and getting them out there where um, the users are actually uh, looking for information. And basically, this all comes down to changes in information acquisition. Uh, it used to be local, now we're more global. It used to be very line linear, now um, we're really going to the links and we're using network resources. Uh, we're going from print to digital. Many individuals who we talk to basically say that if they can't get it in an electronic format, or they're, they're going to find something else. They'll use whatever they can then. Um, we also know that in this, this current environment, we have many challenges. We have budget cuts. Uh, we have um, supposedly high retirement rates. I, I'm not sure I'm seeing that a lot, but maybe some of you are. Uh, uh, hiring freezes, I am seeing that. Um, we have um, some great opportunities, though. Uh, we need to be looking at what we can provide for our constituencies and determine what they will use and what they want and how they evaluate our current services, so an assessment basically, and get the best value for the most use. So the library, what's that? As I said, most individuals associate the library with books or a, a physical building. And they talk about how the library websites are hard to navigate, how the online catalogs, and they don't always call them that. Uh, so I'm using our terminology uh, that they're difficult to use. Uh, the library is inconvenient, uh, limited hours, they have to get there. They really don't equate the electronic resources that are provided by libraries with the library. They equate those, well, first of all, they don't understand the difference between openly available 
and uh, proprietary information. And they also don't understand that the library is paying for these sources that they are getting. I have another quote, uh, an, a UK graduate student, uh, female, age 25, and she says that, because I mean the thing that annoys me most is when these things are online, um, like library catalogs are supposed to be a really good way for looking for books, but usually they are so bad that you are sort of stuck between the two worlds of you can't go and ask someone for anything. You're supposed to use the internet, internet, but they're talking about libraries, not very well developed. So there are a couple of things going on here. She's saying, you know, we're, we're trying to get things electronically, and there's no one there to ask for help. And that's something I'm going to talk about as I move along in this discussion today. Well, how do individuals work? Well, we do know that convenience talks just about everything. Now I say that, but what's convenient today, this minute, for me, uh, may not be convenient for me three hours from now. And so it's really based upon the context and the situation of the need. Uh, we have also found that individuals value human sources, they want simple searches, they often satisfy, so they will take whatever they can to get by. Uh, you know, what's good enough is, is a, a title of a, um, what is enough is the title of a paper we have published, uh, basically about this. Uh, there was a, a another study done that said that in um, that user behaviors, <clears throat> sorry, in the electronic environment tend toward quick views of a few pages, they bounce between resources, and we think that this contradicts the notion of this hardcore researcher who goes in and actually looks at information and uh, reads everything. But again, we have different types of users, and the, the different users behave differently dependent upon the, the, the context and the situation of the need. These are some of the results from a study that we conducted for JISC in 2010. We actually went through several of the JISC reports and their studies and looked at the data, talked to some of the project managers, talked to some of the participants, and tried to come up with this uh, sort of persona of the digital uh, information seeker. I, that was very difficult to do because individuals were not actually uh, using the same questions, the same me methods. They also weren't reporting in the same way. So what we did was come up with some themes. And the theme, themes that, that were very predominant was this power browsing, that how we scan small chunks of information, we view um, just the first few pages, there isn't a whole lot of real reading going on. I find myself doing this. Uh, there's so much information, I know I, I scan uh, information, I don't read it thoroughly unless I think it's something I really need. Uh, again, it's that need, that situation. Uh, there's also the squirreling, these, these short basic searches, uh, and then we download content for later use. Uh, I'd like you to think about your behaviors. Uh, do you often do this as well? I, I do. I, I have saved so many uh, files that I have downloaded, and my problem is I have a very difficult time remembering where I saved them or even remembering uh, that, that they exist. And so I don't think that, that our constituencies are very different than, than us. Again, the situational needs determine the search, um, so does the context. Individuals are very confident in their skills, and this comes up a lot. You know, they, you don't know what you don't know. And individuals um, have, and especially faculty, we even talked to some faculty, uh, they are not aware of what is open access and what is proprietary. When we talk to faculty about 
copyright and their signed publisher agreement, uh, they, had, they had a very, very little understanding of that. Many of them had no idea what they had signed or where that documentation may have been, where they saved it, if they didn't save it, and what the implications of what they had signed or those agreements meant. Now, students, we talk, we've been talking to them a lot about how they determine that something's, and we don't use the word credibility, we don't use the word authority. When we talk to them, we talk to them about how do you determine what to, to use for your academic purposes, and then we also talk about their personal. And you know, common sense comes up. Uh, cross-checking. So if they keep finding the same information in multiple areas, then they think it must be okay. The reputation of the company or the organization. Uh, many of them will look for AC and the non, if it's a website, .ac in the non-US. In the US, it'll be .edu or .gov or .org. I have some quotes about this. This is a, a U.S. secondary school student. So this student is a male, age 17, in his last year of high school. And, and we're talking to these individuals because I think we need to be more active than proactive, and we need to be planning in our, our libraries, our academic and even public libraries, for these new academic uh, users. And this individual said, well, I don't like pick the first one I see. I try to evaluate two or three and see if there's some common things between them. Like if two of them say the same thing, then that must be right, rather than like one. So basically, if two people say something, this individual thinks, well, this is accurate. It's good enough for me. This is a female graduate student, U.S., age 45. So I usually check. I try to test the information. If it's my judgment or also my knowledge in the subject, or I will read more to see if the information is right or wrong. I don't trust it like from the first second. The next is from a U.S. first year undergraduate student, male, age 19. And it's kind of like a guess, and you check to see which one works best or which one gives you the most information. It is not necessarily to see which one is more credible, because if you want credibility, you are not necessarily going to look online for it. So that in many of them perceive that if it's online, it may not be as credible as something that's, that's printed um, in an actual book. And that comes up a lot with these, um, these high school students and undergraduate students, especially the first year undergraduate students. This is a male, age 40, U.S. faculty member. You know, let's say it's not even in an academic context. I have to see the same conclusion reached by lots of different people in different contexts. Like, I need to see the same answer again and again and again. And maybe at some point, that's enough time where it starts to gel to me that this probably is a good approximation of the truth. It might not be the truth, but this seems to be what a lot of people perceive as the truth. So that would be the simplest way to do it. And then the last one is a male, age 18, uh, UK, uh, last year of secondary uh, school. That's the only problem, just knowing what information to use and why. So there's this whole issue um, where I think there's a, a gap that we can definitely fill of helping people to become interactive, evaluative learners. Most researchers are self-taught in their discovery services. Uh, 62% reported no formal training, and this is from um, a study in the UK research by the Research Information Network. Uh, and again, they're very confident in their skills. Doctoral students, there was another study done in the UK where doctoral students 
said that they learn how to get information to do research from their dissertation professors. When we talk to these professors, and we talked to some professors in New Zealand, and they were computer science faculty. And we talked to them in 1996, and we went back and talked to the same individuals in 2011. They all said they were self-taught, and now they're dependent on their graduate students to tell them how to get sources and information. So the graduate students are learning from the faculty, yet the faculty are dependent upon, are depending upon these doctoral and graduate or postgraduate students to help them. Some of the frustrations um, when they talk about the library was the lack of mobile access. Uh, the websites are hard to navigate. They're inconvenient. And again, they associate with books. The faculty, they said accessing online journal articles and back files. And that was something that came up quite a bit. They want this desktop access. They want this immediate access, whether it's on a mobile phone, or if it's on a desktop, a, a, a laptop, any type of device. Uh, they also said they have difficulty discovering non-English content. Uh, they said that a lot of the content that they may want is not available, and it's not available online. So these were some of the history scholars who wanted these primary sources and could not get access to them, either um, in the physical sense or in, uh, electronically in the digital world. Uh, they also talk about the irrelevant information and result list. Uh, when you, we talk to individuals, they seem to think that they understand how Google ranks. But when they, it comes to libraries and databases or library web pages or catalogs, they have no idea how they, the, 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 results, the result lists are selected or ranked, and they question them. Um, also, the, the faculty talked about the lack of specialist search engines. They wanted discipline-specific search engines. Uh, again, I have some quotes. This is uh, a U.S. undergraduate, so, so first-year undergraduate student, male, age 19. I don't use the library. Most students really don't anymore. I know a couple of people that live here, but they don't actually use it for books. They use it as a quiet place to study. This is a, another a U.S first-year undergraduate student, female, age 19. And this was in an interview I just had with her several weeks ago uh, for her diary, her monthly diary. She named an academic library. And she said, it wasn't really, um, it was really not bringing up anything. I did not have much luck. Maybe I'm not used to it. They probably had a lot, but it's a big library, and I'm not patient. Uh, she went on to tell me that she just went online um, and Googled something and found what she needed. Uh, another one is a U.S. first-year undergraduate student, female, age 19. She, and she's talking about the professor, was very direct about certain stuff and wanted me to go to the library. But the research I needed wasn't showing up. So I was like, okay, I'm going to the Internet. And I had to find quotes from books. So I just like was able to go on Google, Google book search, and find the quote I needed. And I didn't write down it was from the internet, so she doesn't really know. And she laughed um, that it's from the internet. So they're doing their little workarounds as well. The tools that they use, big surprise, Google, Wikipedia, uh, they do say that they use the library websites. You've heard what they've said about them. They talk about electronic journals. They don't necessarily know that they are provided by the library. They talk about human sources. They're still very, very important. They communicate with their, with, uh, their classmates, their family, their relatives, their friends. Graduate students. They go to their professors, their advisors, their mentors, and they talk about electronic databases. 
<clears throat> Again, this is this U.S. Uh, first year undergraduate student, female age 19, who I just talked to several weeks ago. And she said, I had a good history with Google. I eventually find what I want. I tried the academic library and the institute, she was talking about an institute website, and could not find what I wanted. I guess with Google, it will search all databases. <clears throat> this is a UK first-year undergraduate student, female, age 19. One of my favorite ways of getting information is by asking people. Instead of Googling all the time, I mostly have faith in the fact that people are actually learning. If I can go to a tutor and ask them something. There, <clears throat> this is a, a U.S last year of high school, male, age 18. I use my friends. I use people that I know, know things about, like if they're maybe not specialized, but know what they are. Ask them first, and then they'll give me information. Because for me, as I said, I'm a people person. I trust what my friends say. I know what to take from them. Maybe they, not, they, they may not be the same as me, and may not believe the same stuff, I know what I can take from them, at least. And this is a female U.S. last year of high school, age 17 student. Like usually with homework, I usually can do it myself. But like, like sometimes, I, was just, I will just like I am my friend on Facebook and be like, hey, do you know how to do this? That is usually how I will do it, or I will text somebody. But for the most part, if I can figure it out, then I just kind of star that question because there really isn't um, just one or two questions. Or I will just go to my parents or my grandma or something. I, I always talk about not using um, information science students for your subjects because I say that you know they're they're usually an anomaly. They act more like us. Well, Don Berto and some colleagues actually did a study and they used information science students and 86% of them said that they use Google daily or weekly, whereas 28% that they said they use the OPAC daily or weekly. So I'm wondering if, and 28%, it's a little more than a quarter of the time each week, but I think that figure is high. Uh, so you could probably imagine that for our, uh, as I say, regular people, regular users, um, it's much, much lower. Researchers, 99.5% of them use journals as the primary source. They talk about Google, Web of Science, PubMed, Science Direct, JSTOR. JSTOR comes up a lot with uh, undergraduates as well. There was young, one young man who told me, you know, I needed some information, and the librarian showed me this really great thing. It's called JSTOR. And he said, now every time I have a question, I go to JSTOR. And so I always say it's sort of like that, you know, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But we talk about a teachable moment. Um, it, he was actually very satisfied with the information he got from the librarian. It worked, so why wouldn't it work every time? And many researchers also mentioned human resources. Uh, they talk about their coworkers, their colleagues, um, other professionals. 71% uh, of the researchers rank journals in their top three resources that they use. The e-journals, very similar to other things. Visit only a few minutes, very short sessions. They do basic searches. They view a few pages. Um, they talk about the back files being difficult. And often the content is discovered through Google. So they're pushed into it through Google. When we look at worldcat.org, uh, we and individuals get into that system and looking for a, a, a source, they are often, almost all of the time, pushed in through uh, a Google search. I think with journals and, and, and everything in general, with any, any resource, 
access is more important than discovery, and full text and online versions are very important, and also the seamless discovery to delivery. We keep hearing that logins, passwords, and authentication interferes with access to the sources. They don't have to do that when they're in Google Scholar. Um, they don't have to do that um, when they're on the open web. Again, electronic databases are not perceived as library sources, and they have frustration locating and accessing uh, full text copies. Now, these um, are some graphs that we have developed from the data we have been collecting in this Digital Visitors and Residents Project with the University of Oxford, University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and OCLC. And JISC is partially funding this uh, from the UK. And we're looking at what we call these four educational phases. And the emerging phase, is, um, that includes that last year of secondary school, high school, first year of university or college. The establishing of the third and fourth years undergraduate students. Embedding are your postgraduate, graduate, doctoral students. And experiencing are your researchers, scholars, faculty, lifelong learners. And this is some of the data that we have collected. Uh, we've interviewed these individuals, and we have a subset who we talk to every month and are doing this for a three-year period. Um, we, we just started with a new emerging stage, so three new um, sorry, six new uh, last year of secondary school, high school participants, and six uh, first year of college university participants, so that we can look at them and compare them to what these individuals at the same stage in their education said two years prior because we're trying to see what variables may be affecting how they interact and find information. You'll see with this graph, um, the major media sites, which is the blue uh, line uh, with the diamond, that they are the highest um, sources mentioned along with uh, Wikipedia. Uh, the emerging students don't mention the major media sites that much. Uh, they get um, much, they, they increase, and then they take a dip again uh, with the, uh, the scholars. Uh, you'll notice the lower percentage of mentions of Wikipedia, and that's the red. It's still high, but lower um, than the, uh, the third and fourth year undergraduate students. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not using that. It may mean that they just don't feel comfortable telling us that they use it. And I'll explain that and have some quotes on that as I move along. You'll see that retail sites, and that's the green, uh, the triangle, uh, they increase. And it may be that individuals don't have this this income, these high school students, uh, first year undergraduates, but as they proceed through their educational phases, they seem to be using retail sites once, much more. What can we learn from that? Well, they're familiar with retail sites, so we should be familiar with them and start trying to make our systems do some of the same things that these retail sites can do. I have a quote from a UK last year high school student, male, age 17, and he said, Wikipedia, I shouldn't use it often, quite often, because anyone can write anything, but it is good as long as you don't rely on it too heavily. And they've been taught this. <coughs> Um, notice the importance of face-to-face -face communication among faculty, um, and that's that blue uh, line with, again, with the, the diamond. Uh, and, and you look at that in comparison to the other educational stages where um, you will see phone and other remote forms of communication is more prevalent. 
some of the phone mentions in the emerging uh, may be linked to the students communicating with their family and friends. And this is, uh, you know, they are away they're from their family and friends and at the college or university. And that came up quite a bit. Uh, you'll see that the uh, chat, the IM chat goes down with each stage um, and then uh, just uh, back up again with the graduate students and then back down uh, with the scholars. The one thing that I find quite interesting about all of this is email is only at 51% with those that first year undergraduate and the last year of, sec of secondary school, high school. But look, as they go through their, uh, they proceed through their educational uh, phases, how email is 100%. And from talking to the emerging stage participants, I think that this may have to do that they have been um, acculturated to the academic environment because how do we communicate email? And when they communicate with us, we've given them any option that they would like and they almost all choose email. And when I ask them why, they tell us, well, that's for administrative things for, for the university. So they see us in that same way. I have a quote from a UK uh, last year of high school student, male, age 18. He talks about private messaging. Just because all my friends have it, it's just an easy way to catch up. And then especially if I need some work to hand in for tomorrow, go and find out on Facebook. Ask all my friends. So they're using Facebook for their academic work as well. Uh, a male, 54, uh, U.S. faculty, talks about phone calls. Just send an email because calling, they're not there. You have a message, they call you back, they're not there. New message, uh, go back and forth. Texting, this is a U.S. Under, uh, undergraduate student, first year, female, age 19. I do use texting a lot more than calling on the phone. Uh, we asked, if, some of them talked about video chat. This is a UK graduate student, female, age 22. I use Skype for communicating with my father and my brother. I tend to see Skype as a use for people. They're not peripheral friends, they're closer friends. And I would like to have longer conversations with them. And so I use Skype as a video function to call someone and talk face to face. Now this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, one of our participants, uh, U.S., uh, uh, first year undergraduate male, age 19, talked about the lady in the library who helps you find things. And whenever I questioned him, which I should not have done as a researcher, and I said, oh, you mean the librarian? And he said, no, the lady in the library. Now, maybe she wasn't a librarian, I don't know. But regardless, the word librarian was only mentioned once in our original interviews with that last, with the, the participants in the last year of high school, first year, um, first year of college university. Now this is something we call the learning black market. Um, this is a quote from a U.S. undergraduate student, so first year, female, age 19. She's talking about Wikipedia. It's like a taboo, I guess, with all teachers. They just all say, you know, when they explain the paper, they always say, don't use Wikipedia. And so this whole learning black market is where learners use non-traditional sources but feel they cannot talk about them in an institutional context. Now, the, the tutors, the professors may not have the same perception as, these, as the students, but this is what comes off. Uh, I don't know about how many of you use Wikipedia, but I look at it just to familiarize myself with the subject. Um, I don't cite it. When I talk to the individuals, they say, the students will say they don't cite Wikipedia, but they'll cite the references at the end of the Wikipedia articles. When I ask them if they read them, most of them say no, they don't read those articles. 
Uh, this is one student, UK, last year of high, secondary school, female, age 16. She says about Wikipedia, avoid it. Uh, a U.S. undergraduate student, male, age 19, first year undergraduate. I mean, if teachers don't like using Wikipedia, they don't want you to use Wikipedia. A lot of students will, will still use Wikipedia and then cite another source. As long as it has the same information and it is not word for word or anything, they'll use Wikipedia because it is the easiest thing to go look up. It will give you a full, in, full in-depth, detailed thing about the information. Teachers don't like it because it's not the most reliable source. Since anyone can post something on there, even though the site is mentioned as monitored, it's because it's too easy. A U.S. Uh, first year undergraduate student, female, age 19. They, professors, I mean, it's not like if you look up 4th of July, it's not like it gives you like some weird explanation of aliens or something. Uh, another student, uh, U.S., first year undergraduate, female, age 19. I use it kind of like I won't cite it on my papers, but I kind of use it as like as a start off line. I go there and look up the general information, kind of read through it so I get a general idea what it is. Then I start going through my research. A UK uh, a first year undergraduate, female, age 19. Everyone knows that you try not to use Wikipedia as a source because it is a cardinal sin. Uh, this is a statistic from the British Library. Um, they said on their website, 84 of the users um, begin an information search with a search engine and then are pushed in to their website. Um, and how many um, begin their search on a, on a library website? 1%. So what can we change? I think improved, uh, we can improve the OPAC. Uh, there was a study done and in uh, 2013, and 63% of the respondents said they would be likely to use um, the library, um, a library cell phone app that would allow them to access and use library sources from their phone. 35% uh, said they would be very likely to use the app, including 45% of smartphone owners and 41% of tablet owners. Uh, there's a quote that we have from a, a U.S. first-year undergraduate student in her diary interview, female, age 19. Uh, not to mention reading online PDF books, it's really cool. But nowadays, you don't have to go to the library to find a book, but it's right there on your laptop. And this is a, a, under, a U.S. graduate student, female, age 23. I know they, the academic library, changed the website. I think they changed that actually pretty recently. But now it just seems like you have more access, just kind of with your library account, just online, you have more access. You don't have to come here. You don't have to call. It just seems like it's easier to find something in researching. Uh, when we, in our VRS study, we learned that even individuals wanted text, email, chat, they wanted to be able to post questions on Facebook, but no matter, even those, use, those people who use virtual reference services, they still preferred face-to-face, -face, which I find very interesting. That was their preference. Uh, also, we can provide links to, uh, to our special collections and our resources in the social network. And in 2012, there was an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education about the University of Nevada, uh, Nevada Reno, where they actually uh, provided, they, they created personas uh, two students who were actually at the university in 1913, and 
pushed and promoted their special collections through the activities of these individuals who came to Y. They had uh, millions of followers. I talked to the uh, library director or dean, and she said that the, in, the use of their special collections um, had increased um, astronomically because of this. Also, the University of Washington includes its special collections in the references in Wikipedia. Well, this is um, a, a site from a, a, another study that was done in 2013. And in the past 12 months, 25% of Americans six, 16 and older visited a library site. 13% used a handheld device to access the library website. <coughs> so what can we do? Well, I think we need to advertise and uh, what we offer, our brand, and our value. And the same study that was done in, um, in 2013 says that um, people told them that they wished they were, they were more aware of the full range of services offered by their libraries. One focus group member loved her local library and rated it highly in all areas except communication. The quote is, there's so much good stuff going on, but nobody tells anybody. When, um, when we asked the VRS users uh, what they really liked about virtual reference services, they, one of them said instantaneous help. And I think that's something we need to think about. Uh, we should be providing search help at the time of need. I uh, talked to a librarian at St. Louis University at ALA Midwinter, and she said the library provided um, pop-up help on their OPAC when, Z when an, an individual retrieves zero items. And she said within the first hour, 20 individuals use that pop-up help. People are used to that in their retail sites. Um, we need to be um, make things very familiar and comfortable to them. Uh, we've asked individuals what would be their perfect um, information way of getting information, and they'll say, "This is a quote: a female, a, her age was between 26 and 34, something clean, simple, streamlined, and user friendly, but also credible sources." Um, it's unfortunate. But in the, there's no right answer, as I said before. And we often have to provide uh, many different modes of services and communication. Uh, this is an example of um, a simple search bar. It's in uh, Trove, which is the, the catalog for the National Library of Australia. Uh, another thing that, that Lork and Dempsey have talked about is looking at social networks and providing the opportunity for individuals to um, provide links to music, photos, videos, to review, to tag, to comment, uh, to rate items. And this is, would really be helpful in our OPACs. This is the Westerfield Public Library, which is in Ohio. And you can see some of the similarities between it and this, the, the look of Amazon.com. And I think this, this is a quote by Brian Matthews. And I think it all comes down to relationship building. And that's something we've learned. Uh, you need to let individuals know you're there. Uh, the, the, the whole thing about the embedded librarian, where maybe we don't need to be in a library, maybe we should be within the departments, attending the classes, either virtually or face-to-face. Or -face. Uh, when we talk to librarians, virtual reference librarians, and we ask them to identify successful virtual reference encounters, uh, they said that 
they, they were successful when they were able to offer instruction and specialized knowledge, and when the user had a positive attitude. When we asked users of virtual reference services um, what made a successful virtual reference encounter, um, they said that those that provided it, the convenience, an accurate answer, and comfortable with the service. However, if they did not get the, the answer, but the librarian was respectful and kind and had some form of um, interpersonal communication with that individual, the individual still felt that that, that was a, a successful encounter. And I think that should tell us something right there. I, have um, many of the, all of the references should be available here. And, and now I'll turn it over um, to Todd and um, we can take some questions. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, first of all, from Robert Boise. Uh, he asks, have you heard faculty say that basic PDF of articles and chapters are actually a good lowest common denominator format, easy to assign and to gather, and he assures us he is not a shield for Adobe? Oh. <laughs> um, no, actually, they, they really didn't. One of the things that did come up, and this um, has been coming up throughout the studies, I should have mentioned, we've been asking some of these same questions since 2003. And something that does come up um, was that they really would like the experience of an, electron or an, an electronic item to be like the print. So they want to be able to highlight, to tag. I know we can do that in some Adobe. Um, one of the things that came out uh, was, and especially with researchers, when they're researching, and I do this, my office is, is just filled with their papers, their books, their um, multiple screens open, and the individuals want to be able to bookmark, tag, and so that, that's another thing that comes up is, is the way we work, and this may not necessarily um, fit uh, the, the, the whole Adobe, but there hasn't been a lot of um, uh, a lot of complaints about it, so that's probably a good thing. Okay, uh, next question, also from Robert. Uh, do any of the 84% of users starting research on a search engine understand that a web scale discovery service on a library site is a search engine, or is this 84% just Google being Yahoo? Um, they, what this study reported was that they Google and, or mostly Google, Yahoo is the next one um, that they use, and that they're pushed into the library website at that point. Um, individuals, what we have found, do not really understand the uh, difference between, as I said, between open access, uh, proprietary information. They don't understand the difference between databases, journals, uh, the um, uh, uh, bibliographic record for a book versus a, um, uh, a journal article like we have in WorldCat. They, when they see different formats as well pulled up on a catalog, um, entry, I mean, from a retrieval from an online catalog, they can't figure out why we have multiple records for the same thing. So um, uh, the users, basically, most of them are not that sophisticated. OK. Uh, next, also from Robert, uh, he writes, I wonder if a lot of undergrads would know the difference between a book chapter and a journal article on many parts of the web. Uh, they do not. And when we talk to them, it, it is quite obvious. And unfortunately, and, and it changes what we're finding in this three-year study. As things change, 
as the, the individuals progress through their educational stages, uh, but because they become more ingrained within that discipline, but no, they do not understand the difference between um, most of the different types of resources. All right. Um, that's really all the questions that we have. Um, there are a couple more uh, comments that were made, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on this. Uh, from Robert again, I may just be crotchety, but the degree of reliance on anonymous crowdsourced Wikipedia and Google's collaboration and pushing Wikipedia to the top of all results means our higher education system is more or less under assault by populists. <laughs> Uh, it could be. Uh, many of the individuals who, and I, I didn't have time to read some of these quotes, but many of the individuals who talk about, you know, the, the crowdsourcing and um, looking at the ratings and the reviews and those things, um, many of the graduate students and upper level undergraduate students and most of the faculty scholars, researchers say that they look at those but they don't necessarily trust them. Uh, so I think that they you know, people like them. They said they especially like them for the um, for fiction. But when it comes to nonfiction, I think people are um, somewhat more critical of what others post. But I, I almost think it's, um, well, it's like me on, on Facebook. I'll see what people are posting and I'm very interested in seeing what they're doing and to follow them, but I'm, I'm I, I'm a, a visitor. I'm working. I'm not posting a lot or posting a lot on their pages. Um, and I think that's what people like about this, the whole crowdsourcing. Um, we have found with the virtual reference that many of the individuals will go directly, I mean, when they put in a question in Google, or um, they will be pushed to Yahoo Answers or some type of social question and answer site, and that they use those more than they use our virtual reference services, and they think they're just fine. And when we have been looking at the transcripts of these SQA and and evaluating them for accuracy, you know, some of them aren't so accurate. But again, I think people satisfy, and then some people know, and, and they're much more critical. All right. Well, that is all the questions we have and also all the time that we have. So I'd like to, once again, on behalf of the NASA Continuing Education Committee, thank Lynn for her presentation, and thank you all for registering and remind you that whenever you leave, you'll be redirected to a survey. Please take a few minutes to fill that out and let us know how we're doing, how we can improve, and what other topics you might like to hear from us. And with that, this is Todd Ian.